In the meantime, they could only speculate about the revealed cosmos. There was, for example, the theory that our twin had come from nowhere and would continue at a uniform crawl or steady gait into nowhere for all time. This theory was popular among academics. An alternative, favoured by those of a religious persuasion, was that our twin was crawling from the birthplace to the time of mating, as were all the stars in the sky, which were obviously also carried by giant turtles. When they arrived, they would briefly and passionately mate for the first and only time, and from that fiery union, new turtles would be born to carry a new pattern of worlds. This was known as the Big Bang Hypothesis. Thus it was that a young Cosmoshelonian of the Steady Gate faction, testing a new telescope with which he hoped to make measurements of the precise albedo of great Artuin's right eye, was on this eventful evening the first outsider to see the smoke rise hubward from the burning of the oldest city in the world. Later that night, he became so engrossed in his studies, he completely forgot about it. Nevertheless, he was the first. There were others. The color of magic. Fire roared through the bifurcated city of ankh Morpok. Where it lit the wizard's quarter, it burned blue and green, and was even laced with strange sparks of the eighth color, octarine. Where its outriders found their way into the vats and oil stores all along Merchant Street, it progressed in a series of blazing fountains and explosions. In the streets of the perfume blenders, it burned with a sweetness. Where it touched bundles of rare and dry herbs in the storerooms of the drug masters, it made men go mad and talk to God. By now, the whole of downtown Moorpork was alight, and the richer and worthier citizens of Ankh, on the far bank, were bravely responding to the situation by feverishly demolishing the bridges. But already the ships in the Moorpork docks, laden with grain, cotton and timber, and coated with tar, were blazing merrily, and their moorings burnt to ashes, were breasting the river Ankh on the ebb tide, igniting riverside palaces and bowers as they drifted like drowning fireflies towards the sea. In any case, sparks were riding the breeze and touching down far across the river in hidden gardens and remote rickyards. The smoke from the merry burning rose miles high in a wind-sculpted black column that could be seen across the whole of the disc world. It was certainly impressive from the cool, dark hilltop a few leagues away, where two figures were watching with considerable interest. The taller of the pair was chewing on a chicken leg and leaning on a sword that was only marginally shorter than the average man. If it wasn't for the air of wary intelligence about him, it might have been supposed that he was a barbarian from the hotland wastes. His partner was much shorter and wrapped from head to toe in a brown cloak. Later, when he has occasion to move, it will be seen that he moves lightly, cat-like. The two had barely exchanged a word in the last 20 minutes, except for a short and inconclusive argument as to whether a particularly powerful explosion had been the oil bond store or the workshop of Kerbal the Enchanter. Money hinged on the fact. Now, the big man finished gnawing at the bone and tossed it into the grass, smiling ruefully. There go all those little alleyways, he said. I like them. All the treasure houses, said the small man. He added thoughtfully, Do gems burn, I wonder? Tis said they're kin to coal. All the gold melting and running down the gutters, said the big one, ignoring him. And all the wine boiling in the barrels. There were rats, said his brown companion. Rats, I'll grant you. It was no place to be in high summer. That too. One can't help feeling, though, uh, well, a uh, uh, momentary. He trailed off, then brightened. We old, old Friedor at the Crimson Leech eight silver pieces, he added. The little man nodded. They were silent for a while as a whole new series of explosions carved a red line across a hitherto dark section of the greatest city in the world. Then the big man stirred. Weasel? Yes? I wonder who started it? The small swordsman, known as the Weasel, said nothing. He was watching the road in the ruddy light. Few had come that way since the Deosil gate had been one of the first to collapse in a shower of white-hot embers. But two were coming up it now. The weasel's eyes, always at their sharpest in gloom and half-light, made out the shapes of two mounted men and some sort of low beast behind them, doubtless a rich merchant escaping with as much treasure as he could lay frantic hands on. 
The weasel said as much to his companion, who sighed. The status of footpad ill suits us, said the barbarian. But as you say, times are hard, and there are no soft beds tonight. He shifted his grip on his sword, and as the leading rider drew near, stepped out onto the road with a hand held up and his face set in a grin nicely calculated to reassure, yet threaten. Your pardon, sir, he began. The rider reined in his horse and drew back his hood. The big man looked into a face blotched with superficial burns and punctuated by tufts of singed beard. Even the eyebrows had gone. Bugger off, said the face. You're brav the humblander, aren't you? Brav became aware that he had fumbled the initiative. The shape and cosmology of the disk system are perhaps worthy of note at this point. There are, of course, two major directions on the disk, hubwood and rimwood. But since the disk itself revolves at the rate of once every 800 days, in order to distribute the weight fairly upon its supportive pachyderms, according to the refogul of Kroll, there are also two lesser directions, which are turnwise and widdershins. Since the disk's tiny orbiting sunlet maintains a fixed orbit while the majestic disk turns slowly beneath it, it will be readily deduced that a disk year consists of not four, but eight seasons. The summers are those times when the sun rises or sets at the nearest point on the rim, the winters those occasions when it rises or sets at a point around 90 degrees along the circumference. Thus, in the lands around the Circle Sea, the year begins on Hog's Watch night, progresses through a spring prime to its first midsummer, Small God's Eve, which is followed by autumn prime and straddling the half-year point on cruel tide, winter secundus, also known as the spindle winter, since at this time the sun rises in the direction of spin. Then comes secundus spring, with summer too on its heels, the three-quarter mark of the year being the night of all's fallow, the one night of the year, according to legend, when witches and warlocks stay in bed. Then, drifting leaves and frosty nights drag on towards back spindle winter and a new hog's watch night nestling like a frozen jewel at its heart. Since the hub is never closely warmed by the weak sun, the lands there are locked in permafrost. The rim, on the other hand, is a region of sunny islands and balmy days. There are, of course, eight days in a disc week and eight colours in its light spectrum. Eight is a number of some considerable occult significance on the disc and must never, ever be spoken by a wizard. Precisely why all the above should be so is not clear, but it goes some way to explain why on the disc the gods are not so much worshipped as blamed. Just go away, will you, said the rider. I haven't got time for you, do you understand? He looked around and added, that goes for your shadow-loving fleabag partner too, wherever he's hiding. The weasel stepped up to the horse and peered at the dishevelled figure. Why, it's Rincewind the wizard, isn't it? He said in tones of delight, meanwhile filing the wizard's description of him in his memory for leisurely vengeance. I thought I recognised the voice. Bravd spat and sheathed his sword. It was seldom worth tangling with wizards. They so rarely had any treasure worth speaking of. He talks pretty big for a gutter wizard, he muttered. You don't understand at all, said the wizard wearily. I'm so scared of you, my spine has turned to jelly. It's just that I'm suffering from an overdose of terror right now. I mean, when I've got over that, then I'll have time to be decently frightened of you. The weasel pointed towards the burning city. You've been through that? he asked. The wizard rubbed a red raw hand across his eyes. I was there when it started. See him, back there? He pointed back down the road to where his travelling companion was still approaching, having adopted a method of riding that involved falling out of the saddle every few seconds. Well, said Weasel. He started it, said Rincewind, simply. Braft and Weasel looked at the figure now hopping across the road with one foot in a stirrup. Fire razor, is he? said Braft at last. No, said Rincewind, not precisely. Let's just say that if complete and utter chaos was lightning, then he'd be the sort to stand on a hilltop in a thunderstorm, wearing wet copper armour and shouting, All gods are bastards. Got any food? There's some chicken, said Weasel, in exchange for a story. What's his name? said Braft, who tended to lag behind in conversations. Two flower. Two flower, said Brown. What a funny name. You, said Rincewind, dismounting, do not know the half of it. Chicken, did you say? 
deviled, said Weasel. The wizard groaned. That reminds me, added the weasel, snapping his fingers. There was a really big explosion about oh, half an hour ago. That was the oil bond store going up, said Rincewind, wincing at the memory of the burning rain. Weasel turned and grinned expectantly at his companion, who grunted and handed over a coin from his pouch. Then there was a scream from the roadway, cut off abruptly. Rincewind did not look up from his chicken. One of the things he can't do, he can't ride a horse, he said. Then he stiffened, as if sandbagged by a sudden recollection, gave a small yelp of terror and dashed into the gloom. When he returned, the being called Two Flower was hanging limply over his shoulder. It was small and skinny and dressed very oddly in a pair of knee-length breeches and a shirt in such violent and vivid conflict of colours that Weasel's fastidious eye was offended even in the half-light. No bones broken by the feel of things, said Rincewind. He was breathing heavily. Braft winked at the weasel and went to investigate the shape that they assumed was a pack animal. You'd be wise to forget it, says the wizard, without looking up from his examination of the unconscious two flower. Believe me, a power protects it. A spell? said Weasel, squatting down. No, but magic of a kind, I think. Not the usual sort. I mean, it can turn gold into copper while at the same time it is still gold. It makes men rich by destroying their possessions. It allows the weak to walk fearlessly among thieves. It passes through the strongest doors to leech the most protected treasuries. Even now it has me enslaved, so that I must follow this madman willy-nilly and protect him from harm. It's stronger than you, Brav. It is, I think, more cunning even than you, Weasel. What is he called, then, this mighty magic? Rincewind shrugged. In our tongue, it is called reflected sounders of underground spirits. Is there any wine? know that I am not without artifice where magic is concerned, said Weasel. Only last year did I, assisted by my friend there, part the notoriously powerful Archmage of Umitri from his stuff, his belt of moon jewels, and his life in that approximate order. I do not fear this reflected sound of underground spirits of which you speak. However, he added, you engage my interest. Perhaps you would care to tell me more. Bravd looked at the shape on the road. It was closer now and clearer in the pre-dawn light. It looked for all the world like a... Uh, a box on legs, he said. I'll tell you about it, said Rincewind, if there's any wine, that is. Down in the valley there was a roar and a hiss. Someone more thoughtful than the rest had ordered to be shut the big river gates that were at the point where the Ark flowed out of the Twin City. Denied its usual egress, the river had burst its banks and was pouring down the fire-ravaged streets. Soon, the continent of flame became a series of islands, each one growing smaller as the dark tide rose. And up from a city of fumes and smoke rose a broiling cloud of steam, covering the stars. Weasel thought that it looked like some dark fungus or mushroom. The twin city of proud Ankh and pestilent Morpork of which all the other cities of time and space are, as it were, mere reflections, has stood many assaults in its long and crowded history, and has always risen to flourish again. So the fire, and its subsequent flood, which destroyed everything left that was not flammable, and added a particularly noisome flux to the survivors' problems, did not mark its end. Rather, it was a fiery punctuation mark, a coal-like comma, or salamander semicolon, in a continuing story. Several days before these events, a ship came up the Ark on the dawn tide and fetched up, among many others, in the maze of wharfs and docks on the Moorpork shore. It carried a cargo of pink pearls, milk nuts, pumice, some official letters for the patrician of Ork, and a man. It was the man who engaged the attention of Blind Hugh, one of the beggars on early duty at Pearl Dock. He nudged Crippleoi in the ribs and pointed wordlessly. Now the stranger was standing on the quayside, watching several straining seamen carry a large brass-bound chest down the gangplank. Another man, obviously the captain, was standing beside him. There was about the seaman every nerve in Blind Hugh's body which tended to vibrate in the presence of even a small amount of impure gold at fifty paces screamed into his brain, the air of one anticipating imminent enrichment. 
Sure enough, when the chest had been deposited on the cobbles, the stranger reached into a pouch, and there was the flash of a coin, several coins, gold. Blind Hugh, his body twanging like a hazel rod in the presence of water, whistled to himself. Then he nudged Wa again and sent him scurrying off down a nearby alley into the heart of the city. When the captain walked back onto his ship, leaving the newcomer looking faintly bewildered on the quayside, Blind Hugh snatched up his begging cup and made his way across the street with an ingratiating leer. At the sight of him, the stranger started to fumble urgently with his mummy pouch. Good day to thee, sire. Blind Hugh began, and found himself looking up into a face with four eyes in it. He turned to run. Uh -huh, said the stranger, and grabbed his arm. Hugh was aware that the sailors lining the rail of the ship were laughing at him. At the same time, his specialised senses detected an overpowering impression of money. He froze. The stranger let go and quickly thumbed through a small black book he had taken from his belt. Then he said, Hello. What? said Hugh. The man looked blank. Hello, he repeated rather louder than necessary, and so carefully that Hugh could hear the vowels tinkling into place. Hello yourself, Hugh reposted. The stranger smiled widely, fumbled yet again in the pouch. This time his hand came out holding a large gold coin. It was in fact slightly larger than an $8,000 Archean crown, and the design on it was unfamiliar. But it spoke inside Hugh's mind in a language he understood perfectly. My current owner, it said, is in need of succor and assistance. Why not give it to him so you and me can go off somewhere and enjoy ourselves? Subtle changes in the beggar's posture made the stranger feel more at ease. He consulted the small book again. I wish to be directed to an hotel, tavern, lodging house, in hospice, caravanserai, he said. What, all of them? said Hugh, taken aback. Hmm? said the stranger. Hugh was aware that a small crowd of fishwives, shellfish diggers and freelance gawpers were watching them with interest. Look, he said, I know a good tavern. Is that enough? He shuddered to think of the gold coin escaping from his life. He'd keep that one even if Umor confiscated all the rest and the big chest that comprised most of the newcomer's luggage looked to be full of gold, Hugh decided. The four-eyed man looked at his book. I would like to be directed to an hotel, place of repose, tavern. Yes, all right. Come on, then, said Hugh hurriedly. He picked up one of the buttons and walked away quickly. The stranger, after a moment's hesitation, strolled up. A train of thought shunted its way through Hugh's mind. Getting the newcomer to the broken drum so easily was a stroke of luck, no doubt of it, and Hugh Moore would probably reward him. But for all his new acquaintances' mildness, there was something about him that made Hugh uneasy. And for the life of him, he couldn't figure out what it was. Not the two extra eyes, odd though they were. There was something else. He glanced back. The little man was ambling along in the middle of the street, looking around him with an expression of keen interest. Something else Hugh saw nearly made him gibber. The massive wooden chest, which he had last seen resting solidly on the quayside, was following on its master's heels with a gentle rocking gait. Slowly, in case a sudden movement on his part might break his fragile control over his own legs, Hugh bent slightly so that he could see under the chest. There were lots and lots of little legs. Very deliberately, Hugh turned around and walked very carefully towards the broken drum. Odd, said Emor. Added Cripplewire. He'd have to be a merchant or a spy, said Emor. 
He pulled a scrap of meat from the cutlet in his hand and tossed it into the air. It hadn't reached the zenith of its arc before a black shape detached itself from the shadows in the corner of the room and swooped down, taking the horse in the air. Second greatest thief in Hong Kong. Half closed his one eye and shrugged. I've checked all the ship, he said. It's a freelance trade. Does the occasional run to the Brown Islands? People there are just savages. They don't understand about spies. And I expect they eat merchants. He looked a bit like a merchant, volunteered Wah. Except he wasn't fat. There was a flutter of wind. He shifted his bulk out of the chair and crossed the room, coming back with a large raven. After he'd unfastened the message capsule from its leg, it flew up to join its fellows lurking among the rafters. Withel regarded it without love. Emor's ravens were notoriously loyal to their master, to the extent that Withel's one attempt to promote himself to the rank of greatest thief in Ark Morpork had cost their master's right-hand man his left eye. But not his life, however. Emor never grudged a man his ambitions. B12, said Emor, tossing the little file aside and unrolling a tiny scroll within. Gorin the cat, said Withel automatically on station up in the Gong Tower at the Temple of Small Gods. He says Q has taken our stranger to the Broken Drum. Well, that's good enough. Broadman is a friend of ours, isn't he? Aye, said Withill. If he knows what's good for trade. Among his customers has been your man, Gorin, said Emor pleasantly. For he writes here about a box on legs. If I read this scroll correctly. He looked at Withel over the top of the paper. Withel looked away. He will be disciplined, he said flatly. Wah looked at the man leaning back in his chair, his black clad frame resting as nonchalantly as a rimland puma on a jungle branch, and decided that Gorin, atop of small god's temple, would soon be joining those little deities in the multifold dimensions and beyond. And he owed Wah three copper pieces. Emor crumpled the note and tossed it into a corner. I think we'll wander along to the drum later on, Withel. Perhaps, too, we may try this beer that your men find so tempting. Withel said nothing. Being Emor's right-hand man was like being gently flogged to death with scented boots. The twin city of Ankh Morpork, foremost of all the cities bounding the Circle Sea, was, as a matter of course, the home of a large number of gangs, thieves' guilds, syndicates, and similar organizations. This was one of the reasons for its wealth. Most of the humbler folk on the Widdishin side of the river, in Morpork's mazy alleys, supplemented their meager incomes by filling some small role for one or other of the competing gangs. So it was that by the time Hugh and Two Flower entered the courtyard of the Broken Drum, the leaders of a number of them were aware that someone had arrived in the city who appeared to have much treasure. Some reports from the more observant spies included details about a book that told the stranger what to say, and a box that walked by itself. These facts were immediately discounted. No magician capable of such enchantments ever came within a mile of more pork dogs. It still being that hour when most of the city was just rising or about to go to bed, there were few people at the drum to watch Two Flower descend the stairs. When the luggage appeared behind him and started to lurch confidently down the steps, the customers at the rough wooden tables, as one man, looked suspiciously at their drinks. Broadman was browbeating the small troll who swept the bar when the trio walked past him. What in hell's there? he said. Just don't talk about it, hissed Hugh. Two Flower was already thumbing through his book. What's he doing? said Broadman, arms akimbo. It tells him what to say. I know it sounds ridiculous, muttered Hugh. How can a book tell a man what to say? I wish for an 
accommodation, uh, room, lodgings, the lodging house full board, are your rooms clean? A room with a view, what is your rate for one night? said Two Flower in one breath. Broadman looked at Hugh. The beggar shrugged. He's got plenty money, he said. Tell him it's three copper pieces then, and that thing will have to go in the stable. Hmm? said the stranger. Broadman held up three thick red fingers, and the man's face was suddenly a sunny display of comprehension. He reached into his pouch and laid three large gold pieces in Broadman's palm. Broadman stared at them. They represented about four times the worth of the broken drum, staff included. He looked at Hugh. There was no help there. He looked at the stranger. He swallowed. Yes, he said in an unnaturally high voice. And then there's meals, of course. Huh? You understand? Yes? Food? You eat? No? He made the appropriate motions. Foot, said the little man. Yes, said Broadman, beginning to sweat. Have a look in your little book. I should. The man opened the book and ran a finger down one page. Broadman, who could read after a fashion, peered over the top of the volume. What he saw made no sense. Food, said the stranger. Yes, cutlet, hash, chop, stew, ragu, fricassee, mince, collops, souffle, dumpling, blancmange, sorbet, gruel, sausage, not to have a sausage, beans without a bean, kickshaws, jelly, jam, giblets. He beamed at Broadman. All that, said the innkeeper weakly. It's just the way he talks, said Hugh. Don't ask me why, he just does. All eyes in the room were watching the stranger, except for a pair belonging to Rincewind the wizard, who was sitting in the darkest corner nursing a mug of very small beer. He was watching the luggage. Watch Rincewind, look at him. Scrawny like most wizards, and clad in a dark red robe, on which a few mystic sigils were embroidered in tarnished sequins. Some might have taken him for a mere apprentice enchanter, who had run away from his master out of defiance, boredom, fear, and a lingering taste for heterosexuality. Yet around his neck was a chain bearing the bronze octagon that marked him as an alumnus of the Unseen University, the high school of magic, whose time and space transcended the campus is never precisely here or there. Graduates were usually destined for mageship at least, but Rincewind, after an unfortunate event, had left knowing only one spell and made a living of sorts around the town by capitalizing on an innate gift for languages. He avoided work as a rule, but had a quickness of wit that put his acquaintances in mind of a bright rodent, and he knew sapient pearwood when he saw it. He was seeing it now, and he didn't quite believe it. An archmage, by dint of great effort and much expenditure of time, might eventually obtain a small staff made from the timber of the sapient pear tree. It grew only on the sites of ancient magic. There were probably no more than two such staffs in all the cities of the Circle Sea. A large chest of it, Rincewind tried to work it out, and decided that even if the box were crammed with star opals and sticks of ornate carbon, then the contents would not be worth one tenth of the price of the container. A vein started to throb in his forehead. He stood up and made his way to the tree. said the wizard gently. He's doing all right on his own, said the innkeeper, but took a few steps back. Rincewind smiled politely at the stranger and tried a few words of tune. He prided himself on his fluency in the town, but the stranger only looked amused. He won't work, said he logically. It's the book, you see. It tells you what to say. Magic. Rincewind switched to high Borogravian, to Vanglemesht, 
Sutri, and even Black Oru. The language with no nouns and only one adjective, which is obscene. Each was met with polite incomprehension. In desperation, he tried heathen trop, and the little man's face split into a delighted grin. At last, he said, my good sir, this is remarkable. Although in trop, the last word, in fact, became a thing which may happen but once in the usable lifetime of a canoe hollowed diligently by axe and fire from the tallest diamond wood tree that grows in the noted diamond wood forests on the lower slopes of Mount Hawaiiawa, home of the fire gods, or so it is said. What was all that? said Broadman, suspiciously. What did the innkeeper say? said the little man. Rincewind swallowed. Broadman, he said. Two mugs of your best ale, please. You can understand him. Oh, sure. Well, uh, tell him he's very welcome. Tell him uh, breakfast is uh, one gold piece. For a moment, Broadman's face looked as though some vast internal struggle was going on. And then he added with a burst of generosity, I'll throw yours in too. Stranger, said Rincewind, levelly. If you stay here, you will be knifed or poisoned by night. But don't stop smiling, or so will I. Eh, come now, said the stranger, looking around. This looks like a delightful place. A genuine, more porkian tavern. I've heard so much about them, you know. All these quaint old beams, and so reasonable too. Rincewind glanced around quickly in case some leakage of enchantment from the magician's quarter across the river had momentarily transported them to some other place. No, this was still the interior of the drum, its walls stained with smoke, its floor a compost of old rushes and nameless beetles, its sour beer not so much purchased as merely hired for a while. He tried to fit the image around the word quaint or rather the nearest trod equivalent, which was that pleasant oddity of design found in the little coral houses of the sponge-eating pygmies on the Orohai Peninsula. His mind reeled back from the effort. The visitor went on, My name is Tea Flower, and extended his hand. Instinctively, the other three looked down to see if there was a coin. Please to meet you, said Ritzman. I'm Ritzman. Look, I wasn't joking. This is a tough place. half out of his purse. Yeah, croaked Rincewind. I mean, no, it won't cause offence. Good. You say this is a tough place. Frequented, you mean, by heroes and men of adventure? Rincewind considered this. Yes, he managed. Excellent. I would like to meet some. An explanation occurred to the wizard. Ah, he said, you've come to hire mercenaries. Warriors who fight for the tribe with the most milk nut meal. Oh no, I just want to meet them, so that when I get home I can say that I did it. Rincewind thought that a meeting with most of the drum's clientele would mean that Two Flower never went home again, unless he lived downriver and happened to float past. Where is your home? he inquired. Broadman had slipped away into some back room, he noticed. Hugh was watching them suspiciously from a nearby table. Have you heard of the city of Bess Pelagic? Well, I didn't spend much time in Trob. I was uh, just passing through, you know. Oh, it's not in Trob. I speak Trob because there are many Betrobby sailors in our ports. Bess Pelagic is the major seaport of the Agatean Empire. Never heard of it, I'm afraid. Two Flower raised his eyebrows. No, it is quite big. You sail turn-wise from the Brown Islands for about a week, and there it is. Are you all right? He hurried round the table and patted the wizard on the back. Rincewind choked on his beer. The counterweight continent. 
Three streets away, an old man dropped a coin into a saucer of acid and swirled it gently. Broadman waited impatiently, ill at ease in a room made noisome by vats and bubbling beakers and lined with shelves containing shadowy shapes suggestive of skulls and stuffed impossibilities. Will? he demanded. One cannot hurry these things, said the old alchemist peevishly. A saying takes time. Ah! He prodded the saucer, where the coin now lay in a swirl of green colour. He made some calculations on a scrap of parchment. Exceptionally interesting, he said at last. Is it genuine? The old man pursed his lips. It depends on how you define the term, he said. If you mean, is this coin the same as, say, a $50 piece? Then the answer is no. I knew it, screamed the innkeeper and started towards the door. I'm not sure that I'm making myself clear, said the alchemist. Broadman turned round angrily. What do you mean? Well, you see, what with one thing and another, 